we are going to be talking about how to soar with resilience and look at what that means. But before we get into that, I would love to know some favorite Bible characters in the room. So turn to the lady next to you and ask them what their favorite Bible character is and why. Favorite Bible character. If you don't know the Bible well, go with Jesus. It's a safe bet, okay? So don't worry, everyone's welcome. You don't need biblical knowledge. Jesus was this good guy that like died for us and stuff. He's great. He takes the lead. Now hang on girls, make sure the other lady gets to tell you theirs too, okay? So swap over. Great. Okay, let's do a shout out. Now, I was really deaf in the last one and I didn't hear any. Uh, so I need big voices. Someone tell me what your neighbor's favorite Bible character was. And Moses. Jesus. Good one. Joyce. How did I know? Love it. Anyone else? Esther. David. Job. Interesting. Who? Dorcas. I love that name. What a name, Dorcas. I love that. Elijah, good one. Any wild cards? Joe's girl, you're prophetic. My absolute favorite. And I mean, it has to be right because I've got the mic. Um, Joseph is officially my favorite, favorite Bible character. I love Joseph. I feel like I relate to Joseph so much much. You know, the storms of life and how amazing has the teaching been, by the way. I don't think you get much new because I think the Holy Spirit wants to work. And a lot of what I'm sharing, I didn't know, but is repeated, which is pretty cool. So I'm going to say it anyway. Um, but honestly, Joseph is my favorite Bible character because I feel like sometimes you read some of the characters in the Bible and they're just like the Christians that floated and everything was like proper good, normal, easy, and they did great. Joseph, I'm like, this is like a roller coaster of life written in what is like 13 odd chapters of Bible. Like the highs and the lows were so extreme for Joseph and yet he still achieved everything that God had purposed and promised for his life. And so when I think about resilience, I don't think I see a much stronger candidate. There are a lot, but when I count up the amount of things that he rose above and he went again and he trusted again and he served again, like, he's just an absolute hero of mine. In fact, if Phoebe, my oldest daughter, was going to be a boy, she was going to be a Joseph. But we kind of changed it by the time we got to Oliver, so I don't know what happened there. But Joseph is an absolute favorite. And, um, you know, and I just listed out, I mean, honestly, I really want to do like a six-week study on Joseph at some point because there's just so much. But just listing off some of the highs and lows. So he had these dreams by God and they were rejected. Rejected by his family. He was disowned downtrodden, beaten and abused by his own family and left for dead. Like, that's a low light. He then diligently serves Potiphar. God blesses him and elevates him and gives him so much favor and whatever he does prospers. It's amazing. Then he is distracted by temptation. He flees that temptation amazingly. He's such a guy of integrity. It's a talk all within itself, but he was detained unjustly. He went to prison for something he didn't do. He upheld his integrity, but then got done for it anyway. Then when he was in prison, he was, once again, really dependable. He was a good, hardworking guy that got up from his issues and he went and he just carried on trusting in the Lord and he was elevated in prison and, again, brought favor with the guards and all the different people. And once again, he was then disremembered by people. He interpreted their dreams. They made a promise they were going to remember him to Pharaoh um, and they forgot him. Like how raw must that have been after everything he went through with his family to have to revisit that, that feeling of being um, disremembered and forgotten and rejected. Then there's this moment where he's in the palace and there's this beautiful verse where it says that he gave God all of the glory for all that he'd done for him and brought him through. And so he was determined to praise God in everything that he'd gone through. There was a moment face to face with his brothers, the people that had left him for dead. And it said that he was so bitter and angry when they said that they should be forgiven, he wailed. 
and wept, a cry so deep and painful because he was face to face with those people. And so he had to decide to forgive them. Then he faced the death of his father. He'd already suffered the loss of his father, thinking he was never going to see him again. And then it's almost like he lost him all over again when he died. And he took actually what looks about five or so months of mourning over his father. And then he finally sees the dreams fulfilled and the destiny that God has for him in the palace. And then it carries on and he still goes through more hard stuff in the midst of the promise. Do you see how this guy has just had what looks like a tidal wave of life and over and over and over again, he gets up and he trusts in the Lord and allows God to use it. So we're looking at what does it mean to soar with resilience? To soar means this, it's to fly or rise high into the air. I love this. It's to maintain height without flapping. Anyone else a flapper? We'll come back to that a few times, don't worry. To maintain height without flapping or to to rise above the usual level. So that's what soaring means. Resilience is the capacity to bounce back or recover from difficult situations. And you know, when I think of that, I think of an elastic band. I am an absolute child. I still think you can have so much fun with an elastic band. I love flicking them, pinging them, see how far they fly, all of that sort of stuff. But what's great about an elastic band is we all know what it feels like to be stretched beyond our capacity. That, that pain of that storm, as Sophia was talking about this morning, of just feeling like one more thing added in and we're going to break and it's going to crumble and we're not going to make it back together. But what I love about elasticity and how it reminds me of resilience is that when it shrinks back, when the pressure's done and it shrinks back, it actually has a new extended capacity. It's physically bigger than it was before it was stretched. And the more it's stretched, the further it grows. And then it has a new stretch and a new reach and a new elasticity. And actually, I did it once where I actually broke an elastic band. And sometimes we think we've gone through so much stuff that we actually then break. But then it's got twice the reach. It still has elasticity. This thing doesn't break. It still has room for growth. It still has its bounce back ability. So what does that look like? What does that mean? We're looking at soaring. What does it mean to soar with resilience, to bounce back from our problems? And we live in a society where it's all about bounce back. I mean, trust me, I had my first daughter at the same time that Kate Middleton had her, who was it, Prince George. Oh, my word. I remember trying to get a family photo. I think it might have been Maggie, actually. And honestly, I was like... I was baggy eyes, not had my hair done, absolutely chuffed as punch, so proud of my little baby on my arm. And she's there in the press and it's like, whoa, girl, you must have teams of people working on you because our realities are very different. I, 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 like our whole culture creates this thing of, oh, just do these three steps and you'll bounce back into shape or do these three things and everything will be fine. And it's not the reality. That's not the bounce back that God has. And so I want to just lean into it of how do we soar? How did Joseph do it? How can we be all that God has called us to be? And the last one, I forgot to reset my timer that's keeping me on track. And we went a bit over. So if I'm on my phone, I'm helping you get lunch. Um, This is a watch, not a phone, just so we all know. Um, How do we then allow God to do that through us? And what can we learn from Joseph? And again, this isn't rocket science. There's a beautiful setting already been laid out before you. But the first first thing is to soar with resilience, we soar in the storm. And Elizabeth's looked at birds already, and I love that idea of chickens and flapping, because again, I do get myself in a bit of a tiz. I think it's a little bit of a personality trait of, I'm just fast and busy and always like flapping and going. And as much as I try and be still, it is kind of just in there. But when that's applied to difficult seasons, it's a negative thing. Because actually, I can't work at it myself. I have to trust in God. And so even then, you have to fight against it. But this is how much of a bird expert I am not. (laughs) When Tom and I moved to Aberdeen about 10 years ago, we came from the Midlands, middle of England. And there were lots of um, pigeons. And I didn't like pigeons. Then we moved here by the sea. And there's a very different species. Wow, they're fierce. Right? But we'd gone for a walk, honestly, days with him moving here. We had to go three and a half hours to our local sea, right? So I was not that educated on birds and sea and tides and all of that thing. <laughs> and we'd gone at night time. And Tom was like, wow, I'm blaming Tom. It was probably definitely me. 
wow, did you see that owl? It was amazing. There's loads of them. They're everywhere. The only bird in my head that flew at night were owls. And so we was there like, wow, how majestic is this moment? There's owls and it's beautiful. And I didn't think you could get them. It took us a while to realize it was the carnage of seagulls. Um, and they will always be out to forage food, no matter what time of day it is. So when I say I'm not brilliant at bird facts, it's true. <laughs> I really don't know a thing or two. But Google knows. And Google's taught me a lot about eagles and how they soar. And eagles actually have this ability to sense the weather. In fact, all birds sense weather. All birds sense when storms are coming. There's something called thermals that happen before a storm. And basically, they're like, we can't see them, but they're hot pockets of air in the atmosphere. And when that hot pocket of air collides with a cold pocket of air, you get a storm. Birds sense the storm. They can feel the thermals. In every other species, according to Google, if you find one, let me know, and I'll change my notes for next time. But every other species of bird senses that thermal and goes back to its nest. It finds shelter, it finds comfort, and it finds safety. But what's beautiful about an eagle is an eagle is the only bird that senses the storm and positions itself in such a way to use that hot current, to use the tension, the stretch, the danger of the storm, and it leans into the hot pocket. It leans into the very danger of the storm, and it takes it. And it takes it higher. And it actually, when it's a really fierce storm, it can take an eagle to space if it rides on the current of the pressure and the hot air. The difference between those that flap and hide and those that don't is the ones that lean into the storm. Not every storm you face is there to block you, but every storm you face can position you for the purpose and promise that God has for you. Not every storm is there to block you, but it can be used for the purpose and position that God has for you. And I think we all see that in the life of Joseph. Joseph went through all of this stuff, but all of that was preparation for what God had in store for him. We see the wisdom that he then led that, that nation with through the famine and through the, uh, uh, what's the opposite to famine? Yeah, the seven years before. Thanks, guys. Um, the plenty, yeah, lots of different words. But amazing how diligent he led that. But it's because he'd learned in the storm this preparation idea that God can do something, that God can use it. So the storms aren't blocking our path, but they can propel us to fulfill our promise. And it was 17 years between Joseph receiving dreams and having this daring idea that maybe, just maybe, God could use me to achieve something for his glory and seeing it even start to be fulfilled. Maybe, just maybe, you've had that daring thought and you're looking at the storm and thinking, there's no way God can use me. Because like Sophia just painted, we all face a storm and we think, well, that's me done. I'm disqualified. Lean into it and allow the Holy Spirit to take you to where he needs to take you in order to see you out of the other side of that storm. We know James 1 uh, uh, verse 2 to 4 really, really well. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may become mature and complete, not lacking anything. God can use your challenge and your trial to allow you to be resilient. And you don't realize that you've been resilient till you look back and realize you're not in the storm anymore. So if you're in the storm, it doesn't mean you're broken. It doesn't mean that you're not doing well enough or you're not trying hard enough. It just means you need to look back and see that it was faithful last time and remind yourself he will be faithful this time. And you will look back to this storm and see the goodness of God and what he's used for it. Praise God. Praise God. So that's the first thing. The second thing, but before I do that, did everyone get a Werther's, by the way? I forgot to ask at the start, slash purposely planned to forget. Did everyone get a Werther's? Oh, here you go. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> did anyone else not get a Werther's? Oh, good. I'm not going to throw, actually. You can get one on the way out. That's a bad idea. It, who's eaten their Werther's? Good job. There's no way could you give me a sweet and expect me not to eat it. Did anyone not eat their Werther's? Wow. Wow. 
legends. Please feel free to eat your Werther's original. If you've got an allergy, may I add the disclaimer? You're not forced. Um, but yeah, eat your Werther's, eat your Werther's. I'll come back to it. There's a point to my Werther's originals, but we'll get to that point three. Point one is we saw with resilience in the storm. I forgot to do this because my clicker broke. We saw in the storm. The second thing is we saw when we surrender. Has anyone been open sea swimming? Like swimming in the North Sea. What are you doing? What are you doing? Go and get a hot water bottle and a cup of coffee. Honestly, I really wanted to try it. I thought, you know, I'm going to give it a go. And so yesterday morning, a few of us, it's 6 (laughs) a.m. We watched the sunrise in the sea. I'm not going to lie. I am absolutely hooked. I loved it. And all the people that I thought were idiots were actually the legends. Sorry. Sorry, Lord. Sorry. Um, But it was an amazing experience. And we got in, and oh my goodness, right? I had a wetsuit, but it was like the short one. And I went in, and I was like, (gasps) and Debbie was saying to me, Leanne, you need to breathe. And I was like, yeah, easier said than done. It's freezing. It's like getting into your fridge at 6 a.m. It's five degrees. But it took my breath so much. And I realized after about 10, 15 minutes, when I was absolutely shattered, that I'd spent 10, 15 minutes, and not just because I'm talking on this, but I was flapping. Do you know when you're in the sea and you're trying to keep yourself afloat? Yeah, Lisa, the pro at sea, sea swimming. I shouldn't have done that, but I did. And so I was there and I was trying to keep myself afloat. Lindsay Bruce, I'm sure you've done her seminar. She just soars through life, right? She was there on her back like, Leanne, just float. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for that. Where was that 15 minutes ago when I needed it? And I was like, right. And I had to take a deep breath. She's like, the salt will keep you up. It's like, oh, yeah, good point. So I just, I just stopped. And I was like, right, take a breath. Trust that this is going to work out. And I stayed up. And all it took was just a little paddle. And I don't know what it is to be an eagle and soar, but I knew, do know what it is to flap in the sea and realize you don't need to. There was this moment where I had to just stop trying to do it on my own and trust that something else had me. When we're in our storms, when we are going through those trials in life, God will always have you. You don't need to work harder. You don't need to do more. You don't need to try harder. But we have to surrender to him. And the beautiful thing is the word, oh no, actually, I'll come to that later. Park that side thought. I'll save that for in a minute. But when we surrender, it looks like this. Jesus surrendered himself so that we wouldn't face our trials on our own. And yet so often we work to try and make our way through the difficulty and the storm. And that's not what God's asked us to do. He's asked us to trust him, to lean on him. And you know, my three-year-old Oliver is four this month. He gets really tired. So they weren't there last night, the kids, because he's just like, he's like me actually. He's like, wah! And then when he's done, he's like, done. <laughs> I don't know where he gets it from. Um, Help me, Lord, right? But he gets to the point, he's like, Mummy, I'm too tired to climb the stairs. Can I have a piggyback? I'm like, yeah, all right then. And quite often, most nights, he'll jump onto my back. I walk him up the stairs and he's like, my legs are falling off, Mummy, they're too tired. He's too tired to make it up the stairs and we brush his teeth and then I carry him to his bed and I put him in. And the beautiful thing is that when we surrender to Jesus, it's like we climb onto his back. And he allows us to soar. The wind of the Holy Spirit as a thermal comes and takes us higher than our situation. Gives us a perspective that he is carrying us. And he allows us to soar in the midst of our challenge. And if you have a broken wing or your legs are too tired and you feel like you can't carry on. Climb onto the back of Jesus and allow him to carry you in that moment. And I've wrestled with this all week because I can look back at so many storms that have come through. And I would say, okay, I think I'm learning the art of resilience. I'm definitely on the journey. You know, we grew up in a house full of uh, abuse. We grew up in a house with addictions. We grew up in so much turmoil, just like the story that was on the stage this morning. So many challenges. And I think I'm starting to learn what resilience is. But I felt like such a hypocrite this week because there's a storm, just like Sophia described, and I cannot explain it right now. And it is so real. And I'm like, God, how can I get and say what I need to live? But the reality is that sometimes we damage our wings. 
and we can't fly. But when we understand that it's on the back of Jesus that we saw, we don't have to stop fulfilling his purposes and the call or ministering to others or being used by God because we're struggling. Because we know that wonderful promise in Corinthians, my favorite verse, I have it on my necklace. And it's a daily reminder when I put it on that his grace is enough for me. Because my, his power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness. Because when I am strong, sorry, when I am weak, he is strong. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 11. It's beautiful, beautiful truth. And here's the thing. Joseph uh, was obviously um, accused by Potiphar. Then he went to prison. There was this 17-year gap between being given a dream, being in the palace, and I think there was then another two years of being in the palace. He was living in the promise that God had given him. He was fulfilling the dreams that God had given him. And then two years in to being in to what would be the sweet spot of his calling, he's face to face with his abusers. The people that should have loved him and cherished him and had rejected him. And they actually lied and they said, dad said that you need to forgive us and can't harm us. And it says he wept bitterly. I don't know if you've ever done one of those pain cries, but that was a pain cry from Joseph. He'd not dealt with unforgiveness. He'd not dealt with bitterness, and yet he was there living in the fulfillment of everything God has. It's evidence that you don't have to have it all together for God to use you. And for some of you in the room, resilience is stepping out and signing up for something. Resilience for you is saying, I'm going to share my story with someone even though it's not complete yet. Resilience is daring to believe that God can use you even in the middle of your storm. It's a beautiful concept. It's time to step out. So we saw in the storm, we saw when we surrender. And again, I know this has all been said, but we saw when we're still like being in the sea. Wish you told me that 15 minutes earlier again. Just chill out. What is it? Float, not sink. I nearly just said sink. That's not what you should do. Just float. We all know that. But actually, soaring comes when we're still. When we flap, we fly. But we'll only go to a certain height. We will only ever achieve so much, and it won't be God's best when we do it in our own strength. You can only soar when you do it in God's strength. Has anyone still got the word as original? Yeah, anyone else? Okay, like two of you, come and see me after because I'm going to give you like an hour's worth of, of, of like suckability. You are absolute suckers. Any other suckers in the room? Who sucks the worthers? I am a fully fledged sucker. My husband is a chomper. Within seconds, his Werther's original is gone. And I timed it this week. And it took the first one, I was having a conversation, so it took a bit longer. It took me 11 minutes, 28 seconds to suck a Werther's original. I mean, guys, a pack can last weeks. It's amazing, <laughs> absolutely amazing. For my husband, it's gone in seconds. But there's something about when you take your time over eating something, that it gets every flavor. It gets every taste bud. And it's funny because this is what Sophia said. And so I really believe that God wants to speak to some people. Because so often we come to God for a quick fix. It's like chomping the worthers. We come, we want to enjoy it, and then we leave again. And it's barely had time to touch the tip of our tongue before it's gone again. And then we need another one. And we need another one. And we try and live off of that. But for those of us that take the time to be still, to spend time to taste and see that the Lord is good, it's then that we saw. It's when we be still, be still and know that I'm God. I'm really chewing over and I've actually got a, an app. And for 40 days, I'm spending it going over and over. Psalm 27, I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. So wait for the Lord. Be strong, take heart and wait for the Lord. I'm in a season of waiting on God. And I'm not going to lie, he's taking his time. Because I'm impatient and he's probably dealing with that impatience. But we have to slow down. Be still before God. And the beautiful thing is I've actually given you two of the same points. Do you know why? The Hebrew word for be still in that context of uh, Psalm 46, the, the phrase, and I can't quite describe the word because it's Hebrew and I'm not Hebrew, but it's something like raphia. And it means to be weak, to let go or to release. So to be still isn't actually to stop. It's to embrace weakness. 
It's to realize, to let go, to release. It's actually to surrender. So I've given you two points on surrender. It wasn't until I did some digging that I realized that. When we take time to sit for a while and realize the challenge and the pain that we're going through, God can move in it. Don't rush past the storm. Try not to go around it, but allow God to take you hand in hand on his back, on his shoulders through it. You cannot be resilient from something you don't know you need to go through. You can't bounce back if you don't realize your intention. It's only when you acknowledge it before Lord and say, Lord, take my weakness, help me in it, that he really will rescue in it. I've got a million stories, but I'm going to park it there and I'm going to leave it with two verses from the life of Joseph. My absolute life verses. And this guy, honestly, I'd love to do a, a whole series on the declarations of Joseph. He names his sons in Genesis 41. And it says his first son, he names Manasseh. And it says, because God has made me forget all of the trouble in my father's household. The second son, he names Ephraim. Because God has made me fruitful in the land of of my suffering. Your storm is testimony to the goodness of God when you come through it. And usually there is someone going through the storm that you've been through. And the fact that God was faithful and brought you through gives that person resilience to know that God's got their back. It's beautiful that the very area where you struggle or find challenge God will use you to then minister to others. And every time Joseph called the kids for supper, Ephraim, Manasseh, God, you are fruitful in the land of my suffering. God, you have brought me through all of the trouble in my father's household. It was a declaration to God of what he'd done. And the final thing he says in Genesis 50, we probably know this one really, really well. What you intended to harm me, God has used for good. The saving of many lives. God is not trying to break you. God will use whatever you're going through to bring glory to his name. If we saw and we lean into the storm, we saw by surrendering and we saw by being still. You are stronger than you know because God is in you. Keep your chin up and keep going. God is good. The movement is because they're a way to prep for the dinner that we're about to receive. So don't panic. Uh, we'll give them 30 seconds to get going. But uh, we are finished and we pray that God, we definitely know he's speaking because I think quite a few of the seminars and the sessions have really overlapped, which is great. Uh, I meant to tell you to go out through that door, but if I'm honest, it caused a bit of a snarl up last time. There's no one else coming from that way because they're all going to lunch. So you can actually go out that way as well, back to dinner, or you can go that way and go round. But that is us finished. Praise God. I hope you're blessed. If you didn't get a word there's, there's a box at the back. Go get one. Suckers, be proud of who you are. And chompers, slow down. Bless you guys. <laughs>